the poet's theme from paradise lost book one by john milton from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox.org by craig franklin the poet's theme of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat sing heavenly muse that on the secret top of oreb or of sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos or if sion hill delight thee more and silo's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of god i thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the aeonian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme and chiefly thou o spirit that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure instruct me for thou knowest thou from the first wast present and with mighty wings outspread dove-like satst brooding on the vast abyss and madest it pregnant what in me is dark illumine what is low rays and support that to the height of this great argument i may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of god to men End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Temptation from Paradise Lost, Book Nine by John Milton. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Four The Higher Life, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator. And Sonia as Satan. The temptation the sun was sunk and after him the star of hesperus whose office is to bring twilight upon the earth short arbiter twixt day and night and now from end to end night's hemisphere had veiled the horizon round when satan who late fled before the threats of gabriel out of eden now improved in meditated fraud and malice bent on man's destruction maugre what might hap of heavier on himself fearless returned by night he fled and at midnight returned from compassing the earth the orb he roamed with narrow search and with inspection deep considered every creature which of all most opportune might serve his wiles and found the serpent subtlest beast of all the field him after long debate irresolute of thoughts revolved his final sentence chose fit vessel fittest imp of fraud in whom to enter and his dark suggestions hide from sharpest sight for in the wily snake whatever slights none would suspicious mark as from his wit and native subtlety proceeding which in other beasts observed doubt might beget of diabolic power active within beyond the sense of brute for now and since first break of dawn the fiend mere serpent in appearance forth was come and on his quest where likeliest he might find the only two of mankind but in them the whole included race his purposed prey in bower and field he sought where any tuft of grove or garden plot more pleasant lay their tendance or plantation for delight by fountain or by shady rivulet he sought them both but wished his hap might find eve separate he wished but not with hope of what so seldom chanced when to his wish beyond his hope eve separate he spies veiled in a cloud of fragrance where she stood half spied 
so thick the roses blushing round about her glowed she fair divinely fair fit love for gods not terrible though terror be in love and beauty not approached by stronger hate hate stronger under show of love well feigned the way which to her ruin now i tend so spake the enemy of mankind enclosed in serpent inmate bad and toward eve addressed his way not with indented wave prone on the ground as since but on his rear circular base of rising folds that towered fold above fold a surging maze his head crested aloft and carbuncle his eyes with burnished neck of verdant gold erect amidst his circling spires that on the grass floated redundant pleasing was his shape and lovely never since of serpent kind lovelier so varied he and of his tortuous train curled many a wanton wreath in sight of eve to lure her eye she busied heard the sound of rustling leaves but minded not as used to such disport before through the field from every beast more duteous at her call than at circean call the herd disguised he bolder now uncalled before her stood but as in gaze admiring oft he bowed his turret crest and sleek enamelled neck fawning and licked the ground whereon she trod his gentle dumb expression turned at length the eye of eve to mark his play he glad of her attention gained the serpent tongue organic or impulse of vocal air his fraudulent temptation thus begun wonder not sovereign mistress if perhaps thou canst who art sole wonder much less arm thy looks the heaven of mildness with disdain displeased that i approach thee thus and gaze insatiate i thus single nor have feared thy awful brow more awful thus retired fairest resemblance of thy maker fair thee all things living gaze on all things thine by gift and thy celestial beauty adore with ravishment beheld there beat beheld where universally admired but here in this enclosure wild these beasts among behold us rude and shallow to discern half what in thee is fair one man except who sees thee and what is one who should be seen a goddess among gods adored and served by angels numberless thy daily train so glows the tempter and his proem tuned into the heart of eve his words made way after some discourse the tempter praises the tree of knowledge so standing moving or to height up grown the tempter all impassioned thus began o sacred wise and wisdom-giving plant mother of science now i feel thy power within me clear not only to discern things in their causes but to trace the way of highest agents deemed however wise queen of this universe do not believe those rigid threats of death ye shall not die how should you by the fruit it gives you life to knowledge by the threatener look on me me who have touched and tasted yet both live and life more perfect have attained than fate meant me by venturing higher than my lot shall that be shut to man which to the beast is open 
or will god incense his ire for such a petty trespass and not praise rather your dauntless virtue whom the pain of death denounced whatever thing death be deterred not from achieving what might lead to happier life knowledge of good and evil of good how just of evil if what is evil be real why not known since easier shunned god therefore cannot hurt ye and be just not just not god not feared then nor obeyed your fear itself of death removes the fear why then was this forbid why but to awe why but to keep ye low and ignorant his worshippers he knows that in the day ye eat thereof your eyes that seem so clear yet are but dim shall perfectly be then opened and cleared and ye shall be as gods knowing both good and evil as they know that ye shall be as gods since i as man internal man is but proportion meet i of brute human ye of human gods so ye shall die perhaps by putting off human to put on gods death to be wished though threatened which no worse than this can bring and what are gods that man may not become as they participating godlike food the gods are first and that advantage use on our belief that all from them proceeds i question it for this fair earth i see warmed by the sun producing every kind them nothing if they all things who enclose knowledge of good and evil in this tree that whoso eats thereof forthwith attains wisdom without their leave and wherein lies the offence that man should thus attain to know what can your knowledge hurt him or this tree impart against his will if all be his or is it envy and can envy dwell in heavenly breasts these these and many more causes import your need of this fair fruit goddess humane reach them and freely taste end of poem this recording is in the public domain the fall from paradise lost book nine by john milton from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox.org by craig franklin as the narrator and lian yao as eve the fall he ended and his words replete with guile into her heart too easy entrance won fixed on the fruit she gazed which to behold might tempt alone and in her ears the sound yet rung of persuasive words impregnant with reason to her seeming and with truth meanwhile the hour of noon drew on and waked an eager appetite raised by the smell so savoury of that fruit which with desire inclinable now grown to touch or taste solicited her longing eye yet first pausing a while thus to herself she mused great are thy virtues doubtless best of fruits though kept from man and worthy to be admired whose taste too long forborne at first essay gave elocution to the mute and taught the tongue not made for speech to speak thy praise thy praise he also who forbids thy use conceals not from us naming thee the tree of knowledge 
knowledge both of good and evil, forbids us then to taste. But his forbidding commends thee more, while it infers the good by thee communicated, and our want. For good unknown sure is not had, or had and yet unknown is as not had at all. In plain then, what forbids he but to know, forbids us good, forbids us to be wise? Such prohibitions bind not, but if death bind us with afterbands, what profits then our inward freedom? In the day we eat of this fair fruit, our doom is, we shall die. How dies the serpent? He hath eaten, and lives, and knows, and speaks, and reasons, and discerns, irrational till then. For us alone was death invented, or to us denied this intellectual food for beasts reserved. For beasts it seems, yet that one beast which first hath tasted envies not, but brings with joy the good befallen him, author unsuspect, friendly to man, far from deceit or guile. What fear I, then? Rather, what know to fear under this ignorance of good and evil, of God or death, of law or penalty? Here grows the cure of all, this fruit divine, fair to the eye, inviting to the taste, of virtue to make wise. What hinders then to reach and feed at once both body and mind? So saying, her rash hand in evil hour forth reached to the fruit she plucked, she ate. Earth felt the wound and nature from her seat sighing through all her works gave signs of woe that all was lost back to the thicket slunk the guilty serpent and well might for eve intent now wholly on her taste nought else regarded such delight till then as seemed in fruit she never tasted whether true or fancied so through expectation high or knowledge nor was godhead from her thought Greedily she engorged without restraint, and knew not eating death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Intercession and Redemption from Paradise Lost, Book Eleven by John Milton. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Four, The Higher Life, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator, Thomas Peter as God's son, and Craig Franklin as God the Father. Intercession and Redemption Thus they, in lowliest plight, repentant stood praying, for from the mercy seat above prevenient grace descending had removed the stony from their hearts, and made new flesh regenerate to grow instead that sighs now breathed unutterable, which the spirit of prayer inspired, and winged for heaven with speedier flight than loudest oratory. Yet their port not of mean suitors, nor important less seemed their petition, than when the ancient pair in fables old, less ancient yet than these, Dusalian and chaste Pyrrha, to restore the race of mankind drowned, before the shrine of Themis stood devout. To heaven their prayers flew up, nor missed the way, by envious winds blown vagabond or frustrate, in they passed dimensionless through heavenly doors, then clad with incense, where the golden altar fumed, by their great intercessor, came in sight before the Father's throne, them the glad son presenting, thus to intercede began see father what first fruits on earth are sprung from thy implanted grace in man these sighs and prayers which in this golden censer mixed with incense i thy priest before thee bring fruits of more pleasing savour from thy seed sown with contrition in his heart than those which his own hand manuring all the trees of paradise could have produced ere fallen from innocence now therefore bend thine ear to supplication hear his sighs though mute unskilful with what words to pray let me interpret for him me 
his advocate and propitiation all his works on me good or not good in graft my merit those shall perfect and for these my death shall pay accept me and in me from these receive the smell of peace toward mankind let him live before they reconciled at least his days numbered though sad till death his doom which i to mitigate thus plead not to reverse to better life shall yield him where with me all my redeemed may dwell in joy and bliss made one with me as i with thee am one to whom the father without cloud serene all thy request for man accepted son obtain all thy request was my decree but longer in that paradise to dwell the law i gave to nature him forbids those pure immortal elements that know no gross no unharmonious mixture foul eject him tainted now and purge him off as a distemper gross to air as gross and mortal food as may dispose him best for dissolution wrought by sin that first distempered all things and of incorrupt corrupted i at first with two fair gifts created him endowed with happiness and immortality that fondly lost this other served but to eternize woe till i provided death so death becomes his final remedy and after life tried in sharp tribulation and refined by faith and faithful works to second life waked in the renovation of the just resigns him up with heaven and earth renewed end of poem this recording is in the public domain Eve's Lament from Paradise Lost, Book Eleven, by John Milton, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Four, The Higher Life, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Eve's Lament from Paradise Lost, Book Eleven. O oh, unexpected stroke, worse than of death, must I thus leave thee, Paradise? Thus leave thee native soil these happy walks and shades fit haunt of gods where i had hoped to spend quiet though sad the respite of that day that must be mortal to us both o oh, flowers that never will in other climate grow my early visitation and my last at even which i bred up with tender hand from the first opening bud and gave ye names who now shall rear ye to the sun or rank your tribes and water from the ambrosial found thee lastly nuptial bower by me adorned with what to sight or smell was sweet from thee how shall i part and whither wander down into a lower world to this obscure and wild how shall we breathe in other air less pure accustomed to immortal fruits end of poem this recording is in the public domain eve to adam from paradise lost book eleven by john milton from the world's best poetry Volume Four, The Higher Life, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Eve to Adam. With sorrow and heart's distress, wearied I fell asleep, but now lead on. In me is no delay. With thee to go is to stay here. Without thee here to stay, is to go hence unwilling. Thou to me art all things under heaven, 
all places thou who from my wilful crime art banished hence this further consolation yet secure i carry hence though all by me is lost such favour i unworthy am vouchsafed by me the promised seed shall all restore end of poem this recording is in the public domain the departure from paradise from paradise lost book twelve by john milton from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin the departure from paradise in either hand the hastening angel caught our lingering parents and to the eastern gate led them direct and down the cliff as fast to the subjected plain then disappeared they looking back all the eastern side beheld of paradise so late their happy seat waved over by that flaming brand the gate with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms some natural tears they dropped but wiped them soon the world was all before them where to choose their place of rest and providence their guide they hand in hand with wandering steps and slow through eden took their solitary way end of poem this recording is in the public domain a psalm of life by henry wadsworth longfellow from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin a psalm of life tell me not in mournful numbers life is but an empty dream for the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem life is real life is earnest and the grave is not its goal dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way but to act that each to-morrow find us farther than to-day art is long and time is fleeting and our hearts though stout and brave still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave in the world's broad field of battle in the bivouac of life be not like dumb driven cattle be a hero in the strife trust no future howe'er pleasant let the dead past bury its dead act act in the living present heart within and god or head lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time footprints that perhaps another sailing o'er life's solemn main a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate still achieving still pursuing learn to labour and to wait end of poem this recording is in the public domain the gifts of god by george herbert from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by lian yao as the narrator and craig franklin as god the gifts of god when god at first made man having a glass of blessing standing by let us said he pour on him all we can let the world's riches which dispersed lie contract into a span so strength first made away then beauty flowed then wisdom honour pleasure 
when almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me, and rest in nature, not the god of nature, so both should losers be. Yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, that, at least, if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Duty by Ellen Sturgis Hooper From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Duty I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and found that life was duty. Was then thy dream a shadowy lie? Toil on, sad heart, courageously, and thou shalt find thy dream to be a noonday light and truth to thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to Duty by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Ode to Duty Stern daughter of the voice of God, O Duty, if that name thou love, Who art a light to guide, A rod to check the erring, and reproof, Thou who art victory and love, when empty terrors over all, from vain temptations dost set free and calms the weary strife of frail humanity. There are who ask not if thine eye be on them, who in love and truth, where no misgiving is, rely upon the genial sense of youth, glad hearts, without reproach or blot, who do thy work and know it not long may the kindly impulse last but thou if they should totter teach them to stand fast serene will be our days and bright and happy will our nature be when love is an unerring light and joy its own security and they a blissful course may hold even now who not unwisely bold live in the spirit of this creed yet find that other strength according to their need i loving freedom and untried no sport of every random gust yet being to myself a guide too blindly have reposed my trust and oft when in my heart was heard thy timely mandate i deferred the task in smoother walks to stray but thee I now would serve more strictly, if I may. Through no disturbance of my soul, or strong compunction in me wrought, I supplicate for thy control, but in the quietness of thought. Me this unchartered freedom tires, I feel the weight of chance desires, my hopes no more must change their name, I long for a repose that ever is the same stern lawgiver yet thou dost wear the godhead's most benignant grace nor know we anything so fair as is the smile upon thy face flowers laugh before thee on their beds and fragrance in thy footing treads thou dost preserve the stars from wrong and the most ancient heavens through thee are fresh and strong to humbler functions awful power i call thee i myself commend unto thy guidance from this hour o oh, let my weakness have an end give unto me 
made lowly wise the spirit of self-sacrifice the confidence of reason give and in the light of truth thy bondman let me live end of poem this recording is in the public domain self inquiry by isaac watts from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by lian ya self inquiry let not soft slumber close my eyes before i've recollected thrice the train of action through the day where have my feet chose out their way what have i learnt where e'er i've been from all i have heard from all i've seen what know i more that's worth the knowing what have i done that's worth the doing what have i sought that i should shun what duty have i left undone or into what new follies run these self-inquiries are the road that leads to virtue and to god end of poem this recording is in the public domain the three enemies by christina georgina rossetti from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada as the narrator thomas peter as the flesh craig franklin as man lian yao as the world and sonia as the devil the three enemies the flesh sweet thou art pale more pale to see christ hung upon the cruel tree and bore his father's wrath for me sweet thou art sad beneath a rod more heavy christ for my sake trod the wine-press of the wrath of god sweet thou art weary not so christ whose mighty love of me sufficed for strength salvation eucharist sweet thou art footsore if i bleed his feet have bled yea in my need his heart once bled for mine indeed the world sweet thou art young so he was young who for my sake in silence hung upon the cross with passion wrung look thou art fair he was more fair than men who deign for me to wear a visage marred beyond compare and thou hast riches daily bread all else is his who living dead for me lacked where to lay his head and life is sweet it was not so to him whose cup did overflow with mine unutterable woe the devil thou drinkest deep when christ would sup he drained the dregs from out my cup so how should i be lifted up thou shalt win glory in the skies lord jesus cover up mine eyes lest they should look on vanities thou shalt have knowledge helpless dust in thee o lord i put my trust answer thou for me wise and just end of poem this recording is in the public domain said i not so by george herbert from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada as the sinner and lian yao as the comforter said i not so said i not so that i would sin no more witness my god i did yet i am run again upon the score my faults cannot be hid what shall i do make vows and break them still twill be but labor lost my good cannot prevail against mine ill the business will be crossed oh say not so 
thou canst not tell what strength thy god may give thee at length renew thy vows and if thou keep the last thy god will pardon all that's past vow while thou canst while thou canst vow thou mayst perhaps perform it when thou thinkest least thy god hath not denied thee all whilst he permits thee but to call call to thy god for grace to keep thy vows and if thou break them weep weep for thy broken vows and vow again vows made with tears cannot be still in vain then once again i vow to mend my ways lord say amen and thine be all the praise end of poem this recording is in the public domain nothing but leaves by lucy e ackerman from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter nothing but leaves nothing but leaves the spirit grieves over a wasted life sin committed while conscience slept promises made but never kept hatred battle and strife nothing but leaves nothing but leaves no garnered sheaves of life's fair ripened grain words idle words for earnest deeds we sow our seeds lo tares and weeds we reap with toil and pain nothing but leaves nothing but leaves memory weaves no veil to screen the past as we retrace our weary way counting each lost and misspent day we find sadly at last nothing but leaves and shall we meet the master so bearing our withered leaves the saviour looks for perfect fruit we stand before him humbled mute waiting the words he breathes nothing but leaves end of poem this recording is in the public domain The World by Frederick William Faber From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The World And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. John 16, verse 8 the world is wise, for the world is old. Five thousand years their tale have told. Yet the world is not happy as the world might be. Why is it? Why is it? Oh, answer me. The world is kind if we ask not too much. It is sweet to the taste and smooth to the touch. Yet the world is not happy as the world might be. Why is it? why is it oh answer me the world is strong with an awful strength and full of life in its breadth and length yet the world is not happy as the world might be why is it why is it oh answer me the world is so beautiful one may fear its borrowed beauty might make it too dear yet the world is not happy as the world might be why is it why is it oh answer me the world is good in its own poor way there is rest by night and high spirits by day yet the world is not happy as the world might be why is it why is it oh answer me the cross shines fair and the church bell rings and the earth is peopled with holy things yet the world is not happy as the world might be why is it why is it oh answer me what lackest thou world for god made thee of old why 
Thy faith hath gone out, and thy love grown cold. Thou art not happy as thou mightest be, For the want of Christ's simplicity. It is blood that thou lackest, thou poor old world, Who shall make thy love hot for thee, frozen old world? Thou art not happy as thou mightest be, For the love of dear Jesus is little in thee. Poor world, if thou cravest a better day, Remember that Christ must have his own way. I mourn thou art not as thou mightest be, But the love of God would do all for thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cry of the Human by Elizabeth Barrett Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 the Higher Life Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator, Jason in Canada as the foolish, Craig Franklin as the friends, Lian Yao as the lovers, and Thomas Peter as God's son. The cry of the human. There is no God, the foolish saith, but none. There is no sorrow. And nature oft the cry of faith in bitter need will borrow. Eyes which the preacher could not school by wayside graves are raised, and lips say, God be pitiful, who never said, God be praised, be pitiful, O God. The tempest stretches from the steep, the shadow of its coming, the beasts grow tame, and near us creep as help were in the human yet while the cloud wheels roll and grind we spirits tremble under the hills have echoes but we find no answer for the thunder be pitiful o god the battle hurtles on the plains earth feels new scythe upon her we reap our brothers for the wains and call the harvest honour draw face to face front line to line one image all inherit then kill curse on by that same sign clay clay and spirit spirit be pitiful o god the plague runs festering through the town and never a bell is tolling and corpses jostled neath the moon nod to the dead carts rolling the young child calls for the cup the strong man brings it weeping the mother from her babe looks up and shrieks away its sleeping be pitiful o god the plague of gold strides far and near and deep and strong it enters this purple chimer which we wear makes madder than the centaurs our thoughts grow blank our words grow strange we cheer the pale gold diggers each soul is worth so much on change and marked like sheep with figures be pitiful o oh god the curse of gold upon the land the lack of bread enforces the rail cars snort from strand to strand like more of death's white horses the rich preach rights and future days and hear no angels scoffing the poor die mute with starving gaze on corn ships in the offing be pitiful o oh god we meet together at the feast to private mirth betake us we stare down in the wine cup lest some vacant chair should shake us we name delight and pledge it round it shall be ours to-morrow god seraphs do your voices sound as sad in naming sorrow be pitiful o oh god we sit together with the skies the steadfast skies above us we look into each other's eyes and how long will you love us the eyes grow dim with prophecy the voice is low and breathless till death us part o oh, words to be our best for love 
the deathless be pitiful o oh god we tremble by the harmless bed of one loved and departed our tears drop on the lids that said last night be stronger-hearted o oh god to clasp those fingers close and yet to feel so lonely to see a light upon such brows which is the daylight only be pitiful o oh god the happy children come to us and look up in our faces they ask us was it thus and thus when we were in their places we cannot speak we see anew the hills we used to live in and feel our mother's smile press through the kisses she is giving be pitiful o oh god we pray together at the kirk for mercy mercy solely hands weary with the evil work we lift them to the holy the corpse is calm below our knee its spirit bright before thee between them worse than either we without the rest of glory be pitiful o oh god we leave the communing of men the murmur of the passions and live alone to live again with endless generations are we so brave the sea and sky in silence lift their mirrors and glass therein our spirits high recoil from their own terrors be pitiful o oh god we sit on hills our childhood wist woods hamlets streams beholding the sun strikes through the farthest mist the city's spire to golden the city's golden spire it was when hope and health were strong but now it is the churchyard grass we look upon the longest be pitiful o oh god and soon all vision waxeth dull men whisper he is dying we cry no more be pitiful we have no strength for crying no strength no need then soul of mine look up and triumph rather lo in the depth of god's divine the son adjures the father be pitiful o oh god end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sifting of peter a folk song by henry wadsworth longfellow from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the sifting of peter a folk song behold satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat luke chapter twenty two verse thirty one in st luke's gospel we are told how peter in the days of old was sifted and now though ages intervene sin is the same while time and scene are shifted satan desires us great and small as wheat to sift us and we all are tempted not one however rich or great is by his station or estate exempted no house so safely guarded is but he by some device of his can enter no heart hath armor so complete but he can pierce with arrows fleet its centre for all at last the cock will crow who hear the warning voice but go unheeding till thrice and more they have denied the man of sorrows crucified and bleeding one look of that pale suffering face will make us feel the deep disgrace of weakness we shall be sifted till the strength of self-conceit be changed at length to meekness wounds of the soul though healed will ache the reddening scars remain and make confession lost innocence returns no more we are not what we were before transgression 
but noble souls through dust and heat rise from disaster and defeat the stronger and conscious still of the divine within them lie on earth supine no longer end of poem this recording is in the public domain vanity by anonymous from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by lian yao vanity the sun comes up and the sun goes down and day and night are the same as one the year grows green and the year grows brown and what is it all when all is done grains of sombre or shining sand gliding into and out of the hand and men go down in ships to the sea and a hundred ships are the same as one and backward and forward blows the breeze and what is it all when all is done a tide with never a shore in sight getting steadily on to the night the fisher droppeth his net in the stream and a hundred streams are the same as one and a maiden dreameth her love-lit dream and what is it all when all is done the net of the fisher the burden breaks and alway the dreaming the dreamer wakes End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Different Minds by Richard Chenevix Trench From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Different Minds some murmur when the sky is clear and wholly bright to view if one small speck of dark appear in the great heaven of blue and some with thankful love are filled if but one streak of light one ray of god's good mercy gild the darkness of their night in palaces are hearts that ask in discontent and pride why life is such a dreary task and all good things denied and hearts in poorest huts admire how love has in their aid love that not ever seems to tire such rich provision made end of poem this recording is in the public domain my recovery by friedrich gottlieb klopstock from the translation of w taylor from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin my recovery recovery daughter of creation too though not for immortality designed the lord of life and death sent thee from heaven to me had i not heard thy gentle tread approach not heard the whisper of thy welcome voice death had with iron foot my chilly forehead pressed tis true i then had wandered where the earth's roll around suns had strayed along the paths where the maned comet soars beyond the armed eye and with the rapturous eager greet had hailed the inmates of those earths and of those suns had hailed the countless host that thronged the comet's disk had asked the novice questions and obtained such answers as a sage vouchsafes to youth had learnt in hours far more than ages here unfold but i had then not ended here below what in the enterprising bloom of life fate with no light behest required me to begin recovery daughter of creation too though not for immortality designed the lord of life and death sent thee from heaven to me end of poem this recording is in the public domain
the ladder of saint augustine by henry wadsworth longfellow from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin the ladder of saint augustine saint augustine well hast thou said that of our vices we can frame a ladder if we will but tread beneath our feet each deed of shame all common things each day's events that with the hour begin and end our pleasures and our discontents are rounds by which we may ascend the low desire the base design that makes another's virtues less the revel of the ruddy wine and all occasions of excess the longing for ignoble things the strife for triumph more than truth the hardening of the heart that brings irreverence for the dreams of youth all thoughts of ill all evil deeds that have their roots in thoughts of ill whatever hinders or impedes the actions of the nobler will all these must first be trampled down beneath our feet if we would gain in the bright fields of fair renown the right of eminent domain we have not wings we cannot soar but we have feet to scale and climb by slow degrees by more and more the cloudy summits of our time the mighty pyramids of stone that wedge like cleave the desert airs when nearer seen and better known are but gigantic flights of stairs the distant mountains that uprear their solid bastions to the skies are crossed by pathways that appear as we to higher levels rise the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight but they while their companions slept were toiling upward in the night standing on what too long we bore with shoulders bent and downcast eyes we may discern unseen before a path to higher destinies nor deem the irrevocable past as wholly wasted wholly vain if rising on its wrecks at last to something nobler we attain end of poem this recording is in the public domain saint christopher by dinah maria mullock craig from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator thomas peter as christ the lord and craig franklin as saint christopher saint christopher carry me across the syrian heard rose up and braced his huge limbs to the accustomed toil my child see how the waters boil the night-black heavens look angry-faced but life is little loss i'll carry thee with joy if needs be safe as nestling dove for all this stream my pilgrims bring in service to one christ a king whom i have never seen yet love i thank thee said the boy cheerful our probus took the burden on his shoulders great and stepped into the waves once more when lo they leaping rise and roar and neath the little child's light weight the tottering giant shook who art thou cried he wild struggling in middle of the ford boy as thou look'st it seems to me the whole world's load i bear in thee yet for the sake of christ thy lord carry me said the child no more our probus swerved but gained the farther bank and then a voice cried hence christopheros be for caring thou hast carried me the king of angels and of men 
the master thou hast served and in the moonlight blue the saints saw not the wandering boy but him who walked upon the sea and over the plains of galilee till filled with mystic awful joy his dear lord christ he knew oh little is all loss and brief the space twixt chore and chore if thou lord jesus on us lay through the deep waters of our way the burden that christophorus bore to carry thee across end of poem this recording is in the public domain scorn not the least by robert southwell from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin scorn not the least when wards are weak and foes encountering strong we're mightier to assault than to defend the feebler part puts up in forced wrong and silent sees that speech could not amend yet higher powers most think though they repine when sun is set the little stars will shine while pike doth range the silly tench doth fly and crouch in privy creeks with smaller fish yet pikes are caught when little fish go by these fleets afloat while those do fill the dish there is a time even for the worms to creep and suck the dew while all their foes do sleep the martin cannot ever soar on high nor greedy greyhound still pursue the chase the tender lark will find a time to fly and fearful hare to run a quiet race he that high growth on cedars did bestow gave also lowly mushrooms leave to grow in hammond's pomp poor mardocus wept yet god did turn his fate upon his foe the laser pined while divers feast was kept yet he to heaven to hell did divers go we trample grass and prize the flowers of may yet grass is green when flowers do fade away end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Right Must Win by Frederick William Faber From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Right Must Win oh it is hard to work for god to rise and take his part upon this battlefield of earth and not sometimes lose heart he hides himself so wondrously as though there were no god he is least seen when all the powers of ill are most abroad or he deserts us at the hour the fight is all but lost and seems to leave us to ourselves just when we need him most ill masters good good seems to change to ill with greater ease and worst of all the good with good is at cross purposes ah god is other than we think his ways are far above far beyond reason's height and reached only by childlike love workmen of god oh lose not heart but learn what god is like and in the darkest battlefield thou shalt know where to strike thrice blessed is he to whom is given the instinct that can tell that god is on the field when he is most invisible blessed is he who can divine where the real right doth lie and dares to take the side that seems wrong to man's blindfold eye for right is right since god is god and right the day must win to doubt would be disloyalty to falter would be sin end of poem this recording is in the public domain
the cost of worth from bitter sweet by josiah gilbert holland from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada the cost of worth from bitter sweet thus is it all over the earth that which we call the fairest and prize for its surpassing worth is always rarest iron is heaped in mountain piles and gluts the laggard forges but gold flakes gleam in dim defiles and lonely gorges the snowy marble flecks the land with heaped and rounded ledges but diamonds hide within the sand their starry edges the finny armies clog the twine that sweeps the lazy river but pearls come singly from the brine with the pale diver god gives no value unto men unmatched by meed of labor and cost of worth has ever been the closest neighbor all common good has common price exceeding good exceeding christ bought the keys of paradise by cruel bleeding and every soul that wins a place upon its hills of pleasure must give it all and beg for grace to fill the measure up the broad stairs that value rears stand motives beckoning earthward to summon men to nobler spheres and lead them worthward end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Labourer by William D. Gallagher From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Labourer Stand up, erect, thou hast the form and likeness of thy God. Who more? A soul as dauntless mid the storm of daily life, A heart as warm and pure as breast ere war what then thou art as true a man as moves the human mass among as much a part of the great plan that with creation's dawn began as any of the throng who is thine enemy the high in station or in wealth the chief the great who coldly pass thee by with proud step and averted eye nay nurse not such belief if true unto thyself thou wast what were the proud one's scorn to thee a feather which thou mightest cast aside as idly as the blast the light leaf from the tree no uncurbed passions low desires absence of noble self-respect death in the breast's consuming fires to that high nature which aspires forever till thus checked these are thine enemies thy worst they chain thee to thy lowly lot thy labour and thy life accursed o oh, stand erect and from them burst and longer suffer not thou art thyself thine enemy the great what better they than thou as theirs is not thy will as free has god with equal favours thee neglected to endow true wealth thou hast not tis but dust nor place uncertain as the wind but that thou hast which with thy crust and water may despise the lust of both a noble mind with this and passions under ban true faith and holy trust in god thou art the peer of any man look up then that thy little span of life may be well trod. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A True Lent by Robert Herrick From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao A True Lent is this a fast, 
to keep the larder lean and clean from fat of veals and sheep is it to quit the dish of flesh yet still to fill the platter high with fish is it to fast an hour or ragged to go or show a downcast look and sour no tis a fast to dole thy sheaf of wheat and meat unto the hungry soul it is to fast from strife from all debate and hate to circumcise thy life to show a heart grief rent to starve thy sin not bin and that's to keep thy lent end of poem this recording is in the public domain from the church porch by george herbert from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia from the church porch thou whose sweet youth and early hopes enhance thy rate and price and mark thee for a treasure hearken unto a verser who may chance rhyme thee to good and make a bait of pleasure a verse may find him who a sermon flies and turn delight into a sacrifice when thou dost purpose aught within thy power be sure to do it though it be but small constancy knits the bones and make us dour when wanton pleasures beckon us to thrall who breaks his own bond forfeiteth himself what nature made a ship he makes a shelf by all means use sometimes to be alone salute thyself see what thy soul doth wear dare to look in thy chest for tis thine own and tumble up and down what thou find'st there who cannot rest till he good fellows find he breaks up house turns out of doors his mind in clothes cheap handsomeness doth bear the bell wisdom's a trimmer thing than shop ever gave say not then this with that lace will do well but this with my discretion will be brave much curiousness is a perpetual wooing nothing with labour folly long a doing when once thy foot enters the church be bare god is more there than thou for thou art there only by his permission then beware and make thyself all reverence and fear kneeling never spoiled silk stockings quit thy state all equal are within the church's gate resort to sermons but to prayers most praying's the end of preaching oh be dressed stay not for the other pin why thou hast lost a joy for it worth worlds thus hell doth jest away thy blessings and extremely flout thee thy clothes being fast but thy soul loose about thee judge not the preacher for he is thy judge if thou mislike him thou conceiv'st him not god calleth preaching folly do not grudge to pick out treasures from an earthen pot the worst speak something good if all one sense god takes a text and preacheth patience end of poem this recording is in the public domain briefs by richard crashaw from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by thomas peter briefs water turned into wine the conscious water saw its god and blushed the widow's mites two mites two drops yet all her house and land fall from a steady heart though trembling hand the other's wanton wealth foams high and brave the other cast away she only gave two went up to the temple to pray two went to pray oh rather say one went to brag the other to pray 
one stands up close and treads on high where the other dares not lend his eye one nearer to god's altar trod the other to the altar's god end of poem this recording is in the public domain jewish hymn in babylon by henry hart millman from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada jewish hymn in babylon god of the thunder from whose cloudy seat the fiery winds of desolation flow father of vengeance that with purple feet like a full wine press treads to the world below the embattled armies wait thy sign to slay nor springs the beast of havoc on his prey nor withering famine walks his blasted way till thou hast marked the guilty land for woe god of the rainbow at whose gracious sign the billows of the proud their rage suppress father of mercies at one word of thine an eden blooms in the waste wilderness and fountains sparkle in the arid sands and timbrels sing in maidens glancing hands and marble cities crown the laughing lands and pillared temples rise thy name to bless o'er judah's land thy thunders broke o lord the chariots rattled o'er her sunken gate her sons were wasted by the assyrian sword even her foes wept to see her fallen state and heaps her ivory palaces became her princes wore the captive's garb of shame her temples sink amid the smouldering flame for thou didst ride the tempest cloud of fate o'er judah's land thy rainbow lord shall beam and the sad city lift her crownless head and songs shall wake and dancing footsteps gleam in streets where broods the silence of the dead the sun shall shine on salem's gilded towers on carmel's side our maidens call the flowers to deck at blushing eve their bridal bowers and angel feet the glittering scion tread thy vengeance gave us to the stranger's hand and abraham's children were led forth for slaves with fettered steps we left our pleasant land envying our fathers in their peaceful graves the stranger's bread with bitter tears we steep and when our weary eyes should sink to sleep in the mute midnight we steal forth to weep where the pale willows shade euphrates waves the born in sorrow shall bring forth in joy thy mercy lord shall lead thy children home he that went forth a tender prattling boy yet ere he die to salem's streets shall come and cannon's vines for us their fruit shall bear and herman's bees their honeyed stores prepare and we shall kneel again in thankful prayer where o'er the cherub seated god full blazed the irradiate dome end of poem this recording is in the public domain example by john keeble from the world's best poetry volume four the high life part two read for librivox dot org by lian ya example we scatter seeds with careless hand and dream we ne'er shall see them more but for a thousand years their fruit appears in weeds that mar the land or healthful store the deeds we do the words we say into still air they seem to fleet we count them ever past but they shall last in the dread judgment they and we shall meet i charged thee by the years gone by for the love's sake of brethren dear keep thou the one true way in work and play 
lest in that world their cry of woe thou hear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Small Beginnings by Charles Mackay From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Small Beginnings A traveller through a dusty road Strewed acorns on the lea and one took root and sprouted up and grew into a tree love sought its shade at evening time to breathe its early vows and age was pleased in heats of noon to bask beneath its boughs the dormouse loved its tangling twigs the bird's sweet music bore it stood a glory in its place a blessing evermore a little spring had lost its way amid the grass and fern a passing stranger scooped a well where weary men might turn he walled it in and hung with care a ladle at the brink he thought not of the deed he did but judged that toil might drink he passed again and lo the well by summers never dried had cooled ten thousand parching tongues and saved a life besides a dreamer dropped a random thought twas old and yet twas new a simple fancy of the brain but strong in being true it shone upon a genial mind and lo its light became a lamp of life a beacon ray a monitory flame the thought was small its issue great a watchfire on the hill it shed its radiance far adown and cheers the valley still a nameless man amid the crowd that thronged the daily mart let fall a word of hope and love unstudied from the heart a whisper on the tumult throne a transitory breath it raised a brother from the dust it saved a soul from death o germ o found o word of love o thought at random cast ye were but little at the first but mighty at the last end of poem this recording is in the public domain the rise of man by john white chadwick from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox .org by sonia the rise of man thou for whose birth the whole creation yearned through countless ages of the morning world who first in fiery vapours dimly hurled next to the senseless crystal slowly turned then to the plant which grew to something more humblest of creatures that draw breath of life wherefrom through infinites of patient pain came conscious man to reason and adore shall we be shamed because such things have been or bait one jot of our ancestral pride nay in thyself art thou not deified that from such depth thou couldst such summits win while the long way behind is prophecy of those perfections which are yet to be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I would I were an excellent divine by Nicholas Breton. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. I would I were an excellent divine. I would I were an excellent divine that had the Bible at my fingers' ends, that men might hear out of this mouth of mine how God doth make his enemies his friends, rather than with a thundering and long prayer be led into presumption or despair. This would I be 
and would none other be but a religious servant of my god and know there is none other god but he and willingly to suffer mercy's rod joy in his grace and live but in his love and seek my bliss but in the world above and i would frame a kind of faithful prayer for all estates within the state of grace that careful love might never know despair nor servile fear might faithful love deface and this would i both day and night devise to make my humble spirits exercise and i would read the rules of sacred life persuade the troubled soul to patience the husband care and comfort to the wife to child and servant due obedience faith to the friend and to the neighbour peace that love might live and quarrels all might cease prayer for the health of all that are diseased confession unto all that are convicted and patience unto all that are displeased and comfort unto all that are afflicted and mercy unto all that have offended and grace to all that all may be amended end of poem this recording is in the public domain the pastor's reverie by washington gladden from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin as the narrator and jason in canada as the pastor the pastor's reverie the pastor sits in his easy chair with the bible upon his knee from gold to purple the clouds in the west are changing momently the shadows lie in the valleys below and hide in the curtains fold and the page grows dim whereon he reads i remember the days of old not clear nor dark as the scripture saith the pastures memories are no day that is gone was shadowless no night was without its star but mingled bitter and sweet hath been the portion of his cup the hand that in love hath smitten he saith in love hath bound us up fleet flies his thoughts over many a field of stubble and snow and bloom and now it trips through a festival and now it halts at a tomb young faces smile in his reverie of those that are young no more and voices are heard that only come when the winds from afar off shore he thinks of the day when first with fear and faltering lips he stood to speak in the sacred place the word to the waiting multitude he walks again to the house of god with a voice of joy and praise with many whose feet long time have pressed heaven's safe and blessed ways he enters again the homes of toil and joins in the homely chat he stands in the shop of the artisan he sits where the master sat at the poor man's fire and the rich man's feast but who to-day are the poor and who are the rich ask him who keeps the treasures that ever endure once more the green and the grove resound with the merry children's din he hears their shout at the christmas tide when santa claus stalks in once more he lists while the campfire roars on the distant mountain side or proving apostleship plies the brook where the fierce young troutlings hide and now he beholds the wedding train to the altar slowly move and the solemn words are said that seal the sacrament of love anon at the font he meets once more the tremulous youthful pair with a white-robed cherub crowing response to the consecrating prayer by the couch of pain he kneels again again the thin hand lies cold in his palm while the last far look steals 
into the steadfast eyes and now the burden of hearts that break lies heavy upon his own the widow's woe and the orphan's cry and the desolate mother's moan so blithe and glad so heavy and sad are the days that are no more so mournfully sweet are the sounds that float with the winds from a far-off shore for the pastor has learned what meaneth the word that is given him to keep rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep it is not in vain that he has trod this lonely and toilsome way it is not in vain that he has wrought in the vineyard all the day for the soul that gives is the soul that lives and bearing another's load doth lighten your own and shorten the way and brighten the homeward road end of poem this recording is in the public domain the two rabbis by john greenleaf whittier from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator thomas peter as rabbi nathan and jason in canada as rabbi isaac the two rabbis the rabbi nathan two score years and ten walked blameless through the evil world and then just as the almond blossomed in his hair met a temptation all too strong to bear and miserably sinned so adding not falsehood to guilt he left his seat and taught no more among the elders but went out from the great congregation girt about with sackcloth and with ashes on his head making his grey locks greyer long he prayed smiting his breast then as the book he laid open before him for the bath calls choice pausing to hear that daughter of a voice behold the royal preacher's words a friend loveth at all times yea unto the end and for the evil day thy brother lives marvelling he said it is the lord who gives counsel in need at Ecbatana dwells Rabbi Ben Isaac, who all men excels in righteousness and wisdom, as the trees of Lebanon, the small weeds that the bees bow with their weight. I will arise and lay my sins before him. And he went his way, barefooted, fasting long with many prayers. But even as one who followed unawares, suddenly in the darkness feels a hand thrill with its touch his own and his cheek fanned by odours subtly sweet and whispers near of words he loathes yet cannot choose but hear so while the rabbi journeyed chanting low the wail of david's penitential woe before him still the old temptation came and mocked him with the motion and the shame of such desires that shuddering he abhorred himself and crying mightily to the lord to free his soul and cast the demon out smote with his staff the blackness round about at length in the low light of a spent day the towers of ecbatana far away rose on the desert's rim and nathan faint and footsore pausing where for some dead saint the faith of islam reared a domed tomb saw some one kneeling in the shadow whom he greeted kindly may the holy one answer thy prayers o stranger whereupon the shape stood up with a loud cry and then clasped in each other's arms the two grey men wept praising him whose gracious providence made their path one but straightway as the sense of his transgression smote him nathan tore himself away o oh, friend beloved no more worthy am i to touch thee for i came foul from my sins to tell thee all my shame haply thy prayers since naught availeth mine may purge my soul and make it white like thine pity me o oh ben isaac i have sinned awestruck ben isaac stood 
the desert wind blew his long mantle backward laying bare the mournful secret of his shirt of hair i too o oh friend if not in act he said in thought have verily sinned hast thou not read better the eye should see than that desire should wander burning with a hidden fire that tears and prayers quench not i come to thee for pity and for help as thou to me pray for me o oh my friend but nathan cried pray thou for me ben isaac side by side in the low sunshine by the turban stone they knelt each made his brother's woe his own forgetting in the agony and stress of pitying love his claim of selfishness peace for his friend besought his own became his prayers were answered in another's name and when at last they rose up to embrace each saw god's pardon in his brother's face long after when his headstone gathered moss traced on the targum march of onkelos in rabbi nathan's hand these words were read hope not the cure of sin till self is dead forget it in love's service and the debt thou canst not pay the angel shall forget heaven's gate is shut to him who comes alone save thou a soul and it shall save thy own end of poem this recording is in the public domain judge not by adelaide ann proctor from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by lian yao judge not judge not the workings of his brain and of his heart thou canst not see what looks to thy dim eyes a stain in god's pure light may only be a scar brought from some well-won field where thou wouldst only faint and yield the look the air that frets thy sight may be a token that below the soul has closed in deadly fight with some infernal fiery foe whose glance would scorch thy smiling grace and cast thee shuddering on thy face the fool thou darest to despise may be the angel's slackened hand has suffered it that he may rise and take a firmer, surer stand, or, trusting less to earthly things, may henceforth learn to use his wings. And judge none lost, but wait and see, with hopeful pity, not disdain. The depth of the abyss may be the measure of the height of pain and love and glory that may rise this soul to God in after days. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Unco Gid by Robert Burns. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. To the Unco Gid. My son, these maxims make a rule, and lump them here together. The rigid righteous is a fool, the rigid wise another. The cleanest corn that e'er was dight, be haste them pails a coffin. So near a fellow creature slight for random fits a daffin. Solomon, Ecclesiastes seven sixteen. Oh, ye were as a gid yourself, so pious and so holy. Ye have not to do but mark and tell your neighbour's faults and folly. Where life is like a wheel gone mill, supplied with store of water, the heap it happens ebbing still, and still the clap plays clatter. Hear me, ye venerable core as counsel for poor mortals that frequent past dus wisdom's door for glaiket folly's portals i 
for the thoughtless careless sakes would here propone defences their duncy tricks their black mistakes their failings and mischances ye see ye state with theirs compared and shuddereth the niffer but cast a moment's fair regard what makes the mighty differ discount what scant occasion give that purity ye pride in and what's aft mere than at the leave ye better at the hiding think when ye cast a gated pulse gaze now and then a wallop what ragings must his veins convulse that still eternal gallop where wind and tide ferry your tail right down ye scud your seaway but in the teeth the bath the sail it makes an uncle leeway see social life and glee sit down all joyous and unthinking till quite transmugrified they groan debauchery and drinking oh would they stay to calculate the eternal consequences or ye mortal dreaded hell to state damnation of expenses ye high exalted virtuous dames tied up in godly laces before ye give poor frailty names suppose a change your cases a dear loved lad convenience snug a treacherous inclination but let me whisper in ye lug ye rablins nae temptation then gently scan ye brother man still gentler sister woman though they may gang a kenning rang to step beside is human one point must still be greatly dark the moving way they do it and just as lamely can ye mark how far perhaps they rue it who made the heart tis he alone decidedly can try us he knows each chord its various tone each spring its various bias then at the balance let's be mute we never can adjust it what's done we partly may compute but know not what's resisted end poem this recording is in the public domain Stone the Woman, Let the Man Go Free by Anonymous From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Stone the Woman, Let the Man Go Free Yes, stone the woman, let the man go free. Draw back your skirts, lest they perchance may touch her garment as she passes. But to him put forth a willing hand to clasp with his that led her to destruction and disgrace shut up from her the sacred ways of toil that she no more may win an honest meal but ope to him all honourable path where he may win distinction give to him fair pressed down measures of life's sweetest joys pass her o maiden with a pure proud face if she puts out a poor polluted palm but lay thy hand in his on bridal day and swear to cling to him with wifely love and tender reverence trust him who led a sister woman to a fearful fate yes stone the woman let the man go free let one soul suffer for the guilt of two it is the doctrine of a hurried world too out of breath for holding balances when nice distinctions and injustices are calmly weighed but ah how will it be on that strange day of fire and flame when men shall wither with a mystic fear and all shall stand before the one true judge shall sex make then a difference in sin shall he the searcher of the hidden heart in his eternal and divine decree condemn the woman and forgive the man end of poem this recording is in the public domain
in prison by may riley smith from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox .org by sonia in prison god pity the wretched prisoners in their lonely cells to-day whatever the sins that trip them god pity them still i say only a strip of sunshine cleft by rusty bars only a patch of azure only a cluster of stars only a barren future to starve their hope upon only stinging memories of a past that's better gone only scorn from women only hate from men only remorse to whisper of a life that might have been once they were little children and perhaps their unstained feet were led by a gentle mother toward the golden street therefore if in life's forest they since have lost their way for the sake of her who loved them god pity them still i say o mothers gone to heaven with earnest heart i ask that your eyes may not look earthward on the failure of your task for even in those mansions the choking tears would rise though the fairest hand in heaven would wipe them from your eyes and you who judge so harshly are you sure the stumbling stone that tripped the feet of others might not have bruised your own are you sure the sad-faced angel who writes our errors down will ascribe to you more honour than him on whom you frown or if a steadier purpose unto your life is given a stronger will to conquer a smoother path to heaven if when temptations meet you you crush them with a smile if you can chain pale passion and keep your lips from guile then bless the hand that crowned you remembering as you go twas not your own endeavour that shaped your nature so and sneer not at the weakness which made a brother fall for the hand that lifts the fallen god loves the best of all and pray for the wretched prisoners all over the land to-day that a holy hand in pity may wipe the guilt away end of poem this recording is in the public domain Conscience and Remorse by Paul Lawrence Dunbar from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator. And Lian Yao as Conscience. Conscience and Remorse Goodbye, I said to my conscience. Goodbye for I and I. And I put her hands off harshly and turned my face away and conscience smitten sorely returned not from that day but a time came when my spirit grew weary of its pace and i cried come back my conscience i long to see thy face but conscience cried i cannot remorse sits in my place end of poem this recording is in the public domain Found Wanting by Emily Dickinson From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Found Wanting Belshazzar had a letter. He never had but one. Belshazzar's correspondent concluded and begun. In that immortal copy, the conscience of us all can read without its glasses on Revelation's wall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dallying with Temptation From the First Part of Wallenstein Act Three, Scene Four By Samuel Taylor Coleridge From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Four 
The Higher Life, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Dallying with Temptation, from the first part of Wallenstein, Act Three, Scene Four. Wallenstein in soliloquy. Is it possible? Is it so? I can no longer what I would, no longer draw back at my liking. I must do the deed, because I thought of it, and fed this heart here with a dream, because I did not scowl temptation from my presence, dallied with thought of possible fulfillment, commenced no movement, left all time uncertain, and only kept the road, the axis open. By the great God of heaven, it was not my serious meaning, it was ne'er a resolve. I but amused myself with thinking of it. The free will tempted me, the power to do or not to do it. Was it criminal to make the fancy minister to hope, to fill the air with pretty toys of air, and clutch fantastic scepters moving toward me? Was not the will kept free? Beheld I not the road of duty clear beside me, but one little step, and once more I was in it. Where am I? Whither have I been transported? No road, no track behind one, but a wall, impenetrable, insurmountable, rises obedient to the spells I muttered and meant not. My own doings tower behind me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Easy to Drift by Oliver Huckle From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Easy to Drift Easy to drift to the open sea The tides are eager and swift and strong And whistling and free are the rushing winds But oh! To get back is hard and long. Easy, as told an Arabian tale, To free from his jar the evil sprite, Till he rises like smoke to stupendous size. But oh, never more can we prison him tight. Easy, as told in an English tale, To fashion a Frankenstein, body and soul, And breathe in his bosom a breath of life. But oh, we create what we cannot control. Easy to drift to the sea of doubt, easy to hurt what we cannot heal, easy to rouse what we cannot soothe, easy to speak what we do not feel, easy to show what we ought to conceal, easy to think that fancy is fate. And oh, the wisdom that comes too late. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Frankfurt's Soliloquy, from A Woman Killed with Kindness, by Thomas Hayward, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Jason in Canada. Frankfurt's Soliloquy O oh God, O oh God, that it were possible to undo things done, to call back yesterday, that time could turn up his swift sandy glass to untell the days and to redeem these hours or that the sun could rising from the west draw his coach backward take from the account of time so many minutes till he had all these seasons called again these minutes and these actions done in them end of poem this recording is in the public domain.